Let's go to the Lord one last time in prayer before we open his word together. Oh, Father, we pray now that you would comfort the afflicted and that you would afflict the comforted by your word. Father, we pray that your spirit would enliven us to respond to your word in an appropriate way, whether that's with repentance, whether that's with rejoicing, whether that's with um, exaltation in what you will do. Father, I pray that you would bring about your purposes in all of our hearts, individually and collectively, as a congregation this morning. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, people are so incredibly creative. It's downright fascinating the things that people can come up with. Recently, Allie and I, we were at a a local sort of uh, fair when we got together with a family from church and we were of course, checking out the food trucks. And when we got there, they had all of the normal fare. Uh, So I'm talking turkey legs and funnel cakes and that really good lemonade that you can only get at the fair. They had all of that stuff, all of the, the normal things. But as we walked around, we came across something that was especially interesting and unexpected. It was a Korean corn dog place. Raise your hand if you've ever been to a Korean corn dog place. It doesn't exist, right? I I thought this was a unicorn. This doesn't exist. It's a little weird. We tried it, but surprisingly, it was actually pretty tasty. Uh, So that set me down a path of thinking about other types of meals that are a, a mashup of two different types of flavors or styles. And I discovered that they actually have a name for this. Do you guys know what it's called? It's called fusion. It's called fusion. It's when you fuse two things together, you bring them together, so you combine the ingredients or traditions and techniques from different cultures to make a new dish. So uh, that's what they do. It seems like the most popular type of fusion is probably Asian and Mexican food, which sounds really tasty. Here's some examples of what you would find at a fusion restaurant. The banh mi sandwich, so think Vietnamese sub sandwich mixed with French ingredients. A lot, I see a couple head nods, yeah, they're really good. Or if a sandwich isn't your thing, there's also the chicken teriyaki tacos. So you take chicken teriyaki, teriyaki you fold it up, uh, put in a little bit of garnish with Japanese seasonings, supposed to be excellent. Or perhaps a little more interesting to the Italians in the room, Curry risot. Is that, is that how you say it? I, I, I don't know how to say it. I'm not Italian. You know how to say it, though. And whatever it is, what they do is they mix uh, risotto with the curry seasoning. And apparently, it's really tasty. Perhaps my favorite in the lineup of fusion foods is Korean tacos. So Korean barbecue uh, in, in uh, short ribs, and, and it's rolled into some sort of Uh, tortilla with salsa and slaw, excellent. Or if that's not your thing, maybe you're getting ready for the tailgate season as you look toward football season, Kung Pao chicken wings. So so your normal chicken wing, but in the sweet and sour sauce. Or something for the Mexican Italians in the room, Mexican lasagna. That's a fusion, of course. So you take your lasagna noodles, shredded chicken, queso fresco, enchilada sauce, whatever it is, You put it together. Well, now that we are all sufficiently hungry, where am I going with this? Where am I going with this? Well, in our creativity, we love to fuse our passions together and to make something new, don't we? That's a a creative element that God has given us. You can even do this with your sports team allegiance. So when I like to watch grown men be grossly overpaid for playing a game, I root for the St. Louis Cardinals, the Boston Celtics, the Oklahoma City Thunder, and last but certainly not least, the Las Vegas Raiders. Well, when I got married, I married a Cleveland Browns fan. (laughs) Growing up, I didn't even know that they existed. I'm still not convinced that a lot of them exist, but I know one of them, and I happen to love her. So I thought, a Browns fan, I thought, man, they're almost mythical. But then I married Allie, and now if the Browns aren't playing the Raiders, 
then I will cheer for them. Why? It's not because I love the Browns. I have a confession. I don't even know what a Brown is besides a bad name for a sports team. I don't know what it is. But I will root for them. Why? Because I love Allie, and she happens to cheer for the Browns. So in that way, I've experienced a sort of fan fusion, haven't I? I, uh, No longer is my fandom purely a Raiders fandom, but it's also, at times, a Cleveland Browns fandom. Well, when it comes to food and sports, a fusion is okay. It can even be a really good thing, a tasty thing. It's one thing to have a, a culinary or a football fusion, but it's not okay for us to make a fusion of our religion. When we attempt to fuse things together in our religion, we end up creating something that is no longer the real thing. So when you try to do that with religion, what's it called? It's called syncretism. It's called syncretism. That's when you, it it comes from the Greek word, syn, of course, that's the, the prefix, and it means with or together. So think of if you were watching the Olympics a couple of weeks ago, you saw synchronized swimming, right? They're all doing something together. It's with one another in unison. Well, with that sort of idea, syncretism is in religion. It's when you take something from another religion and you try to fuse it together with yours. So for instance, Let's say you have Christians, and then all of a sudden there's a a big influx of Muslims. Those are two totally different religions. When you take those two, and if the adherents of both seek to practice their religion in a truthful way, what are you inevitably going to have? You're going to have conflict. If you don't know that, look at what's going on in the UK right now. You have conflict. The reason why is because these things are diametrically opposed. But inevitably, there's somebody who comes along and and they say, well, I don't like to argue, and especially not about religion, so so how about we just compromise? And then what do they do? They start singing war. Why can't we be friends? You, You guys know? That's what they do. They think, why can't we just bring the two together? Why can't we bring the two together and and make a new one? And then, eventually, someone will say, well, here's the solution. Let's take all of the good things from this one, and let's take all of the good things from this one, and let's put them together. Well, inevitably, if you seek to do that with your Christianity, something becomes of, of that that is no longer Christianity. It cannot be mixed. We cannot fuse our religion with anything else. And that is exactly the predicament that Israel was in in Isaiah 65. So many of the Israelites, they had deviated from worshiping God in the way he prescribed. So having considered the nature of syncretism, let's look at the results when syncretism is manifested in our worship. Here's my first observation for us from this text. When we try to synchronize with the worship of the world, it is a smoke in God's nostrils. When we try to mix our Christianity with something from this world, it ends up making a smoke in God's nostrils. So people who seek to worship him on one hand, but turn to their own devices on the other, they end up as a smoke in God's nostrils. Look at that in verse 5. You can see it for yourself. In verse 5. And the meaning isn't entirely clear. It's either that God is angry with them, and hence the reason for the smoke in the nostrils is that he is red hot in his anger, or it could be that their worship is so odious to him that he's repulsed by it. Have you guys ever been camping and you're sitting around the fire and it just so happens that you're sitting on the one side where the smoke continues to blow of course, if, you, if you've ever done that, you think, oh man, this is horrible. I, I, I can't breathe this in. So what do you do? You move to the other side of the fire, and then the wind changes directions, and it follows you there. But if you've experienced that, it's terrible. You, you can't breathe it in. That's what God is saying. Either that, or he's extremely angry at their worship. But either way, 
Either way, whether it's on account of anger or displeasure, it's clear that he or she is a smoke in my nostrils is not what you and I should want to have on our worship report card this semester. But that's exactly what God says about Judah's worship in the time of Isaiah. Here's why it's odious to God, because they're doing all the things that God hates. Look at verses 2 through 4. They provoke God. So they anger him, they exasperate him with their sin because they, they do what he has forbidden them to do. Look in verse 3, they sacrifice in gardens. They make offerings on bricks. So do you remember in the book of Leviticus, I'm sure you've all been doing your quiet times in Leviticus, but in that book, God specifically prohibits them from worshiping on any stone that has been hewn with human hands. He says that they have to be pure stones, not man-made stones. So they're doing exactly what God forbids right here in verse 3. And there's an observation for us right there. God is very particular about the worship that he delights in. Worship, according to the Bible, is not a choose-your-own-adventure. That's not what it is. There are very specific expectations. Secondly, but not only do they offer up the wrong sacrifices, they do not care about God's standard of holiness. This might be their worst misstep. God prohibited, pro- prohibits Israelites from worshiping in cemeteries. And, and now you might be thinking, why? What's, what, what's going on with that? Are, are, are the Israelites, are they just going through some sort of gothic phase here in their worship? No, that's not what's going on. What would happen is the Canaanite cultures that preceded the Israelites in the land, they would worship in those sort of places. And they thought that they were appeasing their God by worshiping there amongst the dead. So that's what they're doing. And they're also worshiping on the mountaintops in verse 7, as Isaiah says in in, uh, verse 7. But not only are they doing that, they're even eating pigs in verse 4. Now, before you get some holy heartburn, Adam, I had a bacon, egg, and cheese bagel on my way in this morning, and you're wondering, wait, am I a syncretizer this morning? No, no, okay? Let me explain. In the Old Covenant, God did not allow them to eat of pigs because the pig was an unclean animal. God's people were forbidden from eating pigs, So that wasn't on the menu, but Israel doesn't care if it's not on the menu because they do what they want, not what God commands them. Well, here's the the principle for us this morning, EBC. When God's people stop worshiping and walking according to the word, it always ends poorly. When we deviate from worshiping in the way that God has prescribed for us, It always ends in our demise. But here's the irony. The whole time they're participating in every evil under the sun, what do they say? They say, keep your distance. I'm a little too holy for regular people like you. Do you see the irony of it all? They're self-righteous in every way, and they have no reason at all to be thumping their chest before God. But the main thing that I want you to see, Emmanuel, is that If you were looking out at a society in Israel at the time that Isaiah is preaching this message, it's not that people weren't worshiping the Lord. That's not their problem. They they claim to be worshiping the Lord, but they were worshiping God, but at the same time, they're engaged in everything that God hates. So it's completely possible for you to think this morning... I'm worshiping God, and at the same time, to be totally misguided in your worship, to to believe the wrong things or practice things that God would not have us to practice. It's possible that we need to reevaluate our worship this morning. If you want some convincing, here are some shocking statistics. Listen to these numbers, And, and this is what many American evangelicals believe. So these are people like us that would claim to be uh, saved by Christ alone, that they would claim to be walking in the faith that you and I are walking in. These are not answers from worldly people outside of the church. 
These are answers from people like you and me. Listen to this. 26% of evangelicals agree with this statement. The Bible, like all sacred writings, contains helpful accounts of ancient myths, but is not literally true. Did you hear that? They, they don't believe it. They don't believe it. It's helpful, sure, but it's just a bunch of mythical stories. It's, it's made up. Over 25%, one out of every four Christians, believes that. Here's another one. Here's the next statement. God accepts the worship of all religions, including Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. How much of the American evangelical church do you think agreed with that statement? 56%. 56%. So, so to extrapolate, that tells you that functionally speaking, over half of the evangelicals in America would likely be comfortable with some sort of syncretism. A little bit of Jesus here, maybe the teachings of Muhammad here, and the Jewish dietary laws over here. If God accepts it all, then it all works. That's shocking, isn't it? It gets worse. 43% of self-professing Christians like us in America would affirm the statement, Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. 43%. Half of the American church thinks that Jesus isn't God. Well, here's a little news flash. If he's not God, he can't save you. If he's not God, his death upon the cross, it means nothing for us. He is the Lord. He is God. Over 50% agreed that worshiping alone or with one's family is a valid replacement for regularly attending church. 28% of U.S. evangelicals, so more than one out of every four, would say, the Bible's condemnation of homosexual behavior doesn't apply today. 37% of American evangelicals believe that gender identity is a matter of choice. That's almost four out of every ten Christians. Well, why do I share those numbers with you? Because I want you to see that in the evangelical church today in America, there is a concerted effort nearly everywhere you turn for Christians to compromise with the world and to take on its beliefs. So if those numbers tell us anything, they tell us that syncretism is alive and well today. It's all around us. And I don't want us to be so foolish to think that our church is the exception. I, you know, I would love to do a little thought experiment and to poll the congregation and to see what you guys would believe on these things. I'm sure that we wouldn't be 100% on everything, would we? Well, that's reflective of, of the ways of this world that so easily creep into our theology. They so easily creep into our Christianity. And in doing so, they, they insert just enough error into our Christianity to make it a false religion. That's exactly what our enemy wants to do. He doesn't want to come outright and blatantly say, hey, this is all false. You should accept it. No, he wants to submit just a little bit of error. Just a little bit. Enough to distort the whole thing and enough to take you captive to something that isn't biblical Christianity. Church, it is a danger all around us. We have to be discerning. We have to be discerning. Uh, just because something is called Christian, it doesn't mean that it always is. Because God demands that we would yield all to his supreme authority, and that all of our worship would be saturated and governed with the commands of Scripture. So here's the, th the scary thing about worship. You didn't know that you're doing something scary this morning. Well, you are. Here's the scary thing. There's more components than what we would like to assume. What do you and I, wh what are we tempted to say about worship? We think, well, primarily, God, he knows our hearts. So it doesn't matter how we worship as long as our hearts are in it. We reduce worship down to our own intentions, don't we? If we have good intentions, then we assume that God will receive us in our worship. But that simply is not true. We don't know, but the Israelites, they may have been doing all of these things with good intentions. They, they might have been worshiping on the mountain. They might have been uh, going into these cemeteries thinking, maybe the true God will actually enjoy these sacrifices more so. We don't know. 
But what we do know is that somehow they thought that they were the holiest guys in the room, according to verse 5. So it's not that they saw it as outright evil. That's the scary part. They thought they were doing well in God's sight. They thought that they were the holy people. But here's what God wants us to see. Worship is not a completion grade. It's not a completion grade. It's not all just about showing up, and nor is it a choose-your-own-adventure. God cares not only that we worship, but also how we worship. In Leviticus 10, verses 1 through 3, after the tabernacle's completed, Aaron's sons, they're a, a, a couple knuckleheads, Nadab and Abihu, they are severely punished by God for their worship. Now, here's a question for you. What was the problem with their worship? What was the problem? If you go back to those verses, it says that their sin was that they offered strange fire to the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So they weren't worshiping according to his commands. So that story, it emphasizes that God is concerned not only with our heart motives. He cares about that. Don't get me wrong. Nor is he simply concerned that people worship him alone, although that, of course, is true. He's also concerned that his people worship him in the right way. If we're not worshiping according to the word, then we're not worshiping the Lord of the word. So when we worship the Lord, we want, if we want it to be a pleasing aroma to, to God. I'm, I'm glad that Jacob prayed for us in that regard even this morning. We want God to receive our worship and smile upon what we are doing here on Schoolies Mountain this morning. So here's, here's some ways that we can ensure that our worship is pleasing to God. Number one, we worship God alone. That's first and foremost. We worship Him alone. Secondly, we worship through the means he has given us in his word. Thirdly, we believe the right things about God in and through our worship. Fourthly, we worship in spirit and in truth. And fifthly, we worship with reverence, awe, and love. If you and I, if we worship according to those five principles, our worship is going to be a pleasing aroma to God. It's like a perfume. He, he, he smells it and he thinks, That is my delight. But if we don't, it's going to be a smoke in God's nostrils. No matter how much we might think we're worshiping, if we're not worshiping according to those principles, it's not a worship that God enjoys. Here's my second observation from this text for us. Syncretizing our Christianity with anything else will end in in meeting God's sword. But serving God faithfully will end in our salvation. That's long. I'll I'll say it again. Syncretizing our Christianity with anything else will end in meeting God's sword, his judgment. But serving God faithfully will end in our satisfaction. So Isaiah, he's got a hard word, doesn't he? In verses 8 through 16, for those who try to fuse their Christianity with something else, he says ultimately the end of embracing anything other than Jesus or Jesus plus anything else, he says it's going to be catastrophic. Look at verses 13 and 14 with me. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, my servants shall eat, but you shall be hungry. Behold, my servants shall drink, but you shall be thirsty. Behold, my servants shall rejoice, but you shall be put to shame. Behold, my servants shall sing for gladness of heart, but you shall cry out for pain of heart and shall wail for breaking of spirit. So let me warn you about at least a few of the types of Christianity that we are tempted to in 21st century America. Number one, we're tempted toward a Christianity that makes no demands of us. So we've seen this in many ways, but perhaps nowhere more so than in our sexuality. I can think of several friends that seem to be walking with Christ in my 20s. And now they're no longer walking with him in a way that accords with God's word. Uh, For a few of them, they wrestled with temptations toward homosexuality for a long time. They were seeking to love Christ and to serve him until eventually they stopped fighting and they just gave up. And so now they are floating downstream in a syncretized Christianity 
And the saddest thing about every single one of them is that they still claim to be Christians. They still think that they're worshiping God. But we cannot serve our flesh and serve Christ at the same time. Amen? We cannot do it. And whether that's heterosexual sin or homosexual sin, we cannot do that. Those things are at war with biblical Christianity. So, Emmanuel, reject any form of Christianity that tells you that you can make peace with what the Bible calls sin. You cannot. You must not. Or else you will not have biblical Christianity. If you do that, you're going to have syncretism and an easy believism. Easy believism, what it does is it focuses on the work of Christ. It says, yeah, I'm saved by what Christ did on the cross. But you know what else it says? It says, but it doesn't matter about my sanctification. I, I don't have to be conformed to what God says in his word. So ultimately, they, they, they don't give any attention to the work of the Spirit in dealing, dealing with the power of sin in the Christian life. But the end of Christianity fused with autonomous sexuality is the sword. It's the sword. It is not salvation. And I know that there are brothers and sisters here this morning that are putting their flesh to death even today. So let me encourage you. Let me encourage you. You are one Sunday closer to an eternity where you never feel tempted to forsake your convictions for the sake of your flesh. You're one Sunday closer to putting off this flesh that so makes war with our salvation in Christ. Here's the second type of Christianity that is afoot in America today. It's a type of Christianity that's fueled with self-righteousness and pride. This is especially important for us, and the reason why is because we live in an immoral culture, don't we? When you look out at the world around us, it is almost completely immoral. So we have to speak things that we see against the things that we see being accepted as good when they're actually evil. There's a lot of things wrong with our society, aren't there? I mean, let's think about it for a moment. Americans are willing to take the lives of unborn babies simply because it's an inconvenience to them. That should be appalling. Americans are, are willing to take the lives of their children because it might get in the way of their career or their school or, or whatever else it is, maybe their dreams. So they're willing to sacrifice human life at the altar of their freedom or at the altar of climate change and population control. And if they are born, if American babies are born, well, most likely, at least a 40 to 50% chance, is that the American babies born this year, they're going to be born out of wedlock. 40 to 50%. That's, that's incredible. That's one out of every two American children that will be born into an already unhealthy structure of the family life, at least talking in a normal sense. So is there any wonder with the problems that we see in our society? We see decay all around us. But the subtlety could be that in denouncing the evils that we have to denounce, we start to see ourselves as fundamentally good. It's so easy to be deceived into thinking that we are something when we are nothing but for God's grace. We're nothing. The people that were esteemed in Jesus' day, who were they? They were the Pharisees. They were the people who had great big heads. They were the people who had all their ducks in the row. They had good jobs, nice families. They seemed to have everything going for them on paper. But when Christ came to them, they were the ones quoting Isaiah 65 verse 5, to Jesus. They said, keep to yourself, Jesus. Don't come near to us. We're too holy for you. They didn't want Jesus because he didn't measure up to their standard. In fact, by their metrics, they saw themselves as being more righteous than the Son of God. That's amazing. If we would be God's faithful servants, then we must remember that we are lowly sinners in need of the salvation from the Son of God. Any light that we have in this life, church, it's been given to us by God. We are nothing without Him. 
Our morality, it didn't save us. In fact, our immorality was the very thing that set us toward the course of hell from the beginning. But God intervened, didn't he? And, And Paul actually quotes these verses in Romans 10 in reference to Gentiles like us in order to remind us that the only reason why you and I believe the gospel is because God sought us. He sought us out. We didn't seek him. He wasn't lost. We were. So let me encourage you. Remind yourself often that if it weren't for God's grace, you would be deserving of nothing but hell. You would be deserving of nothing but God's judgment forever. Even now as Christians, how often do we fail? How often do we fail? We're weak. We're puny in our own efforts. But when God looks at us, when he looks at our attempts to live for him, he smiles on us. Not on account of our spotlessness, no, but on account of the grace of his son who covers all of our faults. I recently heard a a pretty good story about a grandpa uh, visiting his children. In the afternoon, grandpa would always take a nap, so one day the, the grandkids, they decided to play a joke. They put Limburger cheese in his mustache. And now, if you've ever smelt Limburger cheese, you know it is the worst. I don't know anybody who eats it, but if you do, my hat's off to you. Because it smells like a middle school uh, boy's locker room, okay? It's terrible. You do not want to be subjected to the smell of this cheese. So... Of course, when uh, Grandpa, when he wakes up, he starts sniffing, and he says, this room stinks. So he goes in the kitchen, and he, and he sniffs around a little bit more, and he says, this room stinks too. He says, I, I got to get outside. I got to go get some fresh air. So he goes outside, and after a minute of trying to, to breathe in some fresh air, he goes, oh, the whole world, it just stinks. It smells terrible. And so, friend, that's what the self-righteous person is like. They can sniff out all the sins and all the shortcomings of everyone around them, and they think everyone else stinks except them, but sometimes the stink is on you. You see, we cannot stop denouncing the evil of our days. We must. This world stinks, doesn't it? It does. Watch the news. But we must denounce it from a posture of humility, recognizing that we need grace just as much as anyone, and pleading with others to experience God's grace in the same way that we have. Here's the sermon in a nutshell for for those of you, your children, your your parents are going to ask you, hey, what was the sermon all about? Just tell your parents, we stink too. Tell them that, okay? Tell them that. You see, we are not the ones with all the answers God is. We are not the ones with a a spotless perfection. God is. So we must proclaim that loudly, yet also humbly. You see, instead of keep to yourself, do not come near to me, for I am too holy for you, our banner is come with me to the fountain of life and grace. If there's enough for me, there's enough for you. Come and drink. That's our banner. That's what we proclaim, that God is sufficient to save us. The end of Christianity fused with self-righteousness is the scorching fire of God's judgment, but a humble Christianity that boldly denounces the evils of our day while also confidently resting in the grace and the mercy of God, that delights the Lord. Here's the third type of Christianity on the fusion menu. It's the type of Christianity that's fused with the things of this world. Emmanuel, in our pursuit of God, we must be willing to lay down the things that this world touts as ultimate. The world tells us to pursue wealth and possessions to the detriment of our spiritual soul. It tells us to pursue those things, and it doesn't matter what happens of your soul. Our world preaches to us that personal or professional success and the status that will come with it, it will satisfy us. No, it won't. No, it won't. There's no climbing of the the ladder in the rat race that's going to satisfy your soul. It's not going to ultimately bring you comfort. The entertainments of this world, they seek to numb us to the things of God. They want 
to anesthetize you throughout your life. The entertainment that, that's so readily available to all of us, it wants you to go through life numb. Our desires for a comfortable and convenient lifestyle, if unchecked, they'll lead us to prioritize ease over the challenge of serving others and living for God. It's easier to live a life focused on ourselves rather than on God and on one another. Amen? That's just easier. It's easier to, to be self-considered. It's easier to be absorbed with my needs and not yours. But that's not the way of God. Or political beliefs or party affiliations. Can that become so central to one's identity that they overshadow core Christian teachings? You bet it can. Here's a little test case scenario for you. Here's a test case scenario. I'll give you an example. If you're not willing to criticize your favorite candidate's views on abortion, then you are blinded by your loyalties. And I know that because I know both of their stances on abortion, and they're not the biblical view. So, so friend, be willing to criticize everything that doesn't come into subjection. We are Bible people, not party people first, okay? I'm a party person, don't get me wrong. I like to party, but not like that. We are Bible people. We submit ourselves to Scripture. John tells us this, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is what? It's not in him. It's not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride and possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. According to Isaiah in verses 13 and 14, those who try to mix their Christianity with something else, they end up hungry and thirsty. They'll have shame and pain of heart eternally. EBC, this is why the purity of our worship is so important. We want nothing more than, than Christ and his gospel to be magnified. He alone can save us. The Spirit alone can give us life. The Father alone will be our joy and delight. Syncretizers, they will be slaughtered, but God's servants, they will be satisfied. And I know that in preaching to you, so I know, I, know, I know the first part of this sermon, it's been hard. It's been a hard word, and the reason why is because it's a hard text. But now, here, let me comfort you, because I know that in preaching to you as God's church, you are holy and beloved by the Lord. You are bought by the blood of Christ, and in preaching to you, I am preaching to people who do not want to syncretize their Christianity with anything else. So let me encourage you. If that is you, keep diligently watching over your heart and the purity of your religion before God. Keep doing it. Don't grow weak. Don't, don't fail now. Keep going. God's servants are going to eat and drink and rejoice and have gladness of heart forever and ever. You're vigilant about a lot of things in your life. I know that you are. For instance, if you planted a garden this year, I'm guessing that you're keeping it. I'm guessing that you're going to that garden, you're taking out weeds, you're watering the garden often, you're checking to see if there are new fruits, you're plucking them, you're, you're pruning the tree as according to how you should be. You're vigilant over that. Or if you think, I don't have a green thumb, Adam, okay, okay, duly noted. Well, what about... Uh, with your retirement. With your retirement, I don't think, most likely, you don't just say, okay, I'm going to set this and I don't care about it for the next 40 years. No, you check that thing, don't you? Because you want to know, my, my money's not going out. It's not leaking to something else. It's not plummeting, taking a nosedive. You're vigilant over that. Or, or for your children, you, you're vigilant over what they're consuming, whether it's food or media, whatever else it is. I know that you are vigilant in your life. Well, you should be vigilant over all those things. But we should also be vigilant about the purity of our worship. Does that even come onto our radar? Are we worshiping according to the standard that God has given us? A Christianity that pleases God is one that is sensitive to his leading. It's one that's diligent to pray that God would reveal our temptation to serve idols. So I encourage you, be all the more vigilant over your worship. And if even now, maybe you're saying, Adam, I've gone this far in the sermon. It's been, uh, I don't know, an hour and 15 minutes this morning, and now I feel discouraged. 
I feel like I've been living for the world. Well, let me bring your attention to verse 1. Look at verse 1. This is what God says. He says, I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am. Here am I. He's ready to be sought by you. The Lord, if you feel guilty over your sin, if you feel like, man, I have been living for the world. I've been basking in all these things that are syncretism. If that's you this morning, well then know, know, friend, that the Lord would have you to see that even now His grace is more than sufficient to cover all of your weaknesses. There is more mercy in Christ than sin in us. His power is made perfect in our what? In our weakness. In our weakness. So there's more than enough grace in the gospel for you. There is more than enough for all of us. God sent his son to bear the consequence of our sins so that we might receive the righteousness of God. The very thing that we could never earn. And Christ the Lord, the one who worshiped God perfectly with never so much as even an ounce of the world mixed into his heart, never a hint of misguided or wrong worship, our Father is well pleased in Christ. And if Christ died for our sins, then what does that mean for us? It means that he is well pleased with us. It means that he looks upon us and he smiles, that we are his children. In Christ, friends, we have an older brother who has entered into heaven He has prepared a place for us, and now, slowly but surely, He is also preparing us for that place. So never, ever, ever tire of going back to God and depending upon His grace. He calls out to you this morning, trapped in your sin. He calls out to you. He says, here am I. Here am I. Come and receive my grace. Let me cover over your sin. Repent and turn away and let me do the work of cleansing you. He's ready to receive you. He is ready to forgive you. He's ready to cleanse you from all of your transgressions. Syncretizing our Christianity with anything else will end in meeting God's sword, but serving God faithfully will end in our satisfaction. So let's end our time together basking in the glory of what will be ours in Christ. Here's my third observation. It's a short one so that we can go and eat all the fusions that our hearts would desire after this. Look in verses 17 through 25. This passage details the new heavens and the new earth that God is going to make. And I know that all of about five of you might be wanting me to dive into the details of what eschatological system I hold to and the details of how these eight verses fit into that system. I'm not going to do that much to the relief of all of the rest of you in the room. If you want to talk about that after the service, I can, but I'm not going to do that right now. And the reason why is because that would be to fail to see the forest through the trees. That would be like standing in front of an exquisitely beautiful painting and then turning to the guy next to you and arguing over when it was uh, painted in the life of the, uh, the artist. Okay, do you you see that? If you do that, you're going to miss the beauty of what stands in front of you. So here's just a little picture of the new heavens and the new earth according to these verses. He says that we will be totally provided for, totally joyful, totally free from the presence of sin, totally at peace, and totally secure. So all of the curses upon creation, they're going to be gone. And listen to this. The former times, they're going to be forgotten. Did you guys notice that? Do we have pains in this life? Do we? Absolutely. Are there sorrows that bring us to our knees and break our hearts? We know them all too well, don't we? We know the pain of loved ones passing away. That's been experienced by many in the congregation even recently. We know the pain of debilitating disease. We know the heartbreak of broken relationships and the pain of unbelieving loved ones. We know the pain of a lack of unity at times. But the pains and sorrows and struggles we have, we're not even going to remember them. Isn't that incredible? Uh, They won't even come to mind. I, I don't know how 
God is going to do this, but I know he will do this. The sorrows, friend, this is God's promise to you if you're a Christian, the sorrows that are so real and so raw right now, the things that you feel so deeply in your soul, you won't even be able to call them to mind. You won't even be able to remember them. So Christian, keep enduring. Keep enduring. There's coming a day when we won't need to be vigilant over the purity of our worship before God. Where we won't need to worry about the seeds of the world being sown into our hearts because we will see God face to face forever. Verse 24 says, as soon as we so much as even think of our need, God will hear. That's amazing. (laughs) As soon as as you just... Even feel, oh God, I, oh wait, I didn't even get to complete my thought. God will hear. He'll know. He'll care for his people. He'll provide with you tangibly. But we're not there yet, are we? We're not there yet. So keep looking forward. And allow this vision of the rest that awaits our souls to spur us on into the purity of our worship and the devotion to our God alone. Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, we would worship you alone and we would worship you according to the way that you have commanded. Oh, God, would you purify our hearts? Oh, God, if there be dross in us, if there be anything that is stubble and would not pass through the fire of your judgment, Lord, I pray that you would refine us that you would sanctify us into the image of Christ our Lord. We thank you that he had the perfect track record that we need, that he offered himself up for us, and that in clinging to him we have hope of a new heaven and a new earth that you will provide. And so, Father, I pray that you would endure us and that you would encourage us as we move closer and closer to that day when we see you forever, uninhibited by our sin. We pray all this in Jesus' name.